having me here today. I really appreciate it. It's a little bit morning. So, um, you, you mentioned my book, and my book actually grew out of um, some speeches that I wrote shortly after Rand was elected to the U.S. Senate. Uh, people would ask me to give speeches, different civic groups and Republican Party groups. And I realized early on that rather than give speeches about policy, it gave me an opportunity to really reflect on our family's values, where we came from, and patriotism. And the person that most inspired my patriotism was my grandmother, Julia O'Toole, who is the centerpiece of my book, True and Constant Friends. My grandmother immigrated from Ireland to this country in 1929 at only 19 years old. She came here all alone. And to me, her humble story epitomizes the American dream and the guiding principles that have made this the greatest country on earth. My brave grandma, Julia, still only a teenager, sailed across the Atlantic alone with just a small bit of money sewn into her clothes. She fled extreme poverty in Ireland and sailed to this country with just one hope, and that was to find work to send money home to her family. Her father was an invalid after being gassed by the Germans in World War I. And her mom was struggling to find a way to feed my grandmother and her younger brother and sister in a country full of impoverished people with absolutely no opportunity. My grandma was desperate to find a way to help them, and America became her beacon. She reached out to a distant aunt named Nora, who worked as a laundress in New York City. And Aunt Nora saved money for years to buy my grandma a third class ticket on a ship called the Adriatic, which carried hundreds and hundreds of Irish immigrants to this country, people that had nothing but dreams and the desire to work hard. When I was a little girl, I loved to listen to my grandmother's stories, which were told in her beautiful, musical Irish brogue. She was a natural storyteller, and honestly, a bit of an exaggerator, <laughs> as, as all great storytellers are, right? <laughs> Despite the hardships in her life, though, she always viewed her circumstances, both past and present, in the rosiest and most optimistic possible light. In the stories of her voyage to the United States, she usually sounded a lot more like a movie star or an heiress rather than a poor girl <laughs> traveling alone with nothing. From her example, I learned many things, but the one that has served me best in my life and especially in my new life in politics is to laugh at circumstances whenever you can and refuse to let them define you or crush your spirit. My grandmother was a wee bit of a snob about the fact that she had a sponsor in the United States who paid for her passage in third class on the Adriatic. This meant that she did not have to travel in steerage. If any of you remember the movie The Titanic, you saw the hundreds and hundreds of Irish immigrants that were packed into the bowels of this ship. Well, that was steerage. And the Adriatic was actually part of the famous white. I had a sponsor, don't you know, Kelly? I was not in steerage with the rabble. <laughs> we had gay dances and parties in third class. <laughs> My favorite part of her voyage story when I was a little girl was the last night of their journey to America when she was crowned Miss White Star Line. My grandmother was so charming and outgoing that she had befriended all of the employees on the ship over their time crossing the Atlantic. And they wanted to make her last night special. So all the chambermaids got together and they created an elaborate gown for her made out of the monogrammed white star saying, everyone was in high spirits because the next day we knew we would be sailing past the Statue of Liberty and arriving on the shores of the greatest country on earth. My entire life I've never known anyone who was more patriotic than my grandmother. She always celebrated the 4th of July with more enthusiasm than anyone, and with all of her fly flags flying. When I would listen to her story as a teenager, I was in awe of her bravery, traveling alone at such an incredibly young age, with no way to reach her family if she needed them, or even to know if she would ever see them again. In fact, my grandmother never did see her mother again. But her stories were never sad, 
They were always full of romance, danger, the stuff of novels, and I ate it up. My grandmother was always being pursued by handsome rogues and devils, as she put it. And I had to put a stop to their fresh ways, don't you know? <laughs> she was a very small woman, just a little bit over five feet tall. And she had to quit school at only 12 years old to go to work as a maid in Ireland. But her work ethic, her character, her optimism, and her attitude defined the character of our great nation. Her first job when she arrived in New York City was as a live-in maid for the founders of the Saks Fifth Avenue stores. And so all, this is where she developed her love of fashion and home decor, <laughs> if you can imagine, and that lasted <laughs> all of her life. And all during my childhood and into my 20s, my grandmother would bring me wonderful glittering things whenever she would visit from New York. Usually beaded purses and large colorful pieces of costume jewelry. Just the words New York would conjure images of glamour and sophistication for me. I can probably blame her for my purse obsession. Pictures of me at age three feature a large ladies handbag circa 1945 draped over my uh, tricycle handle handlebars. So even at three, I couldn't venture down the driveway without my bag. <laughs> But more importantly, her gifts always had great stories behind them, because most of them were cast off from her longtime wealthy employers, Mrs. Wertheimer and Mrs. Roskin. They were wealthy women of New York, or as my grandmother liked to say with a raised eyebrow, high society. <laughs> when I was 15, Grandma gave me a small beaded evening purse, which I prize to this day. It's covered in intricate ivory glass beads and seed pearls, and it has a sparkling design of crystal buttons on the clasp. The cream lining is heavy silk and had a fancy label from a New York store. My grandmother loved to make a big production out of everything, and I can still remember her pressing that purse into my hands and telling me how special it was. She described her elegant employer, the wealthy Mrs. Roskin, carrying that purse to lots of glittering charity balls and parties in New York. I want you to have it, she told me, because I have a feeling that you're going to take it lots of wonderful places one day. <laughs> I was 15 years old, and for the first time, my attention shifted from my grandmother's stories about the wealthy ladies of New York and all their fabulous cast-offs to my grandmother herself. My whole life, I'd listened to her stories of Mrs. Wertheimer and Mrs. Roskin, who she worked for, but it had never really occurred to me until that moment to talk to her about what she did. We were cuddled on the sofa in my parents' den in Russellville, Kentucky, and I remember asking her, Grandma, what was your job for Mrs. Roskin? And I'll never forget her response. She said, oh, Kelly, I handled everything for her, nearly all of her affairs. I was her confidant, her trusted advisor, and her true and constant friend. I nodded, fascinated as always, by the dramatic language that my grandmother could bring to even the most ordinary conversation. Despite her lack of any formal education, having to quit school at only 12 years old, she had a beautiful, lyrical way of speaking, having worked in upper class crust households all of her life. But being 15, it didn't really occur to me in that moment that that was a rather unorthodox job description. Later, after my grandparents traveled back to New York in their gigantic Oldsmobile, I was standing in the kitchen and showing my mom the beaded purse and going on and on about grandma and her exciting life in New York when I caught a fleeting sadness in my own mom's eyes. Kelly, she said, you know that grandma was Mrs. Roskin's maid, right? And at the time, my 15-year-old self kind of felt let down by that. My glamorous grandmother from New York was a maid, but now her life and her lessons have taught me one of my greatest lessons, and that is that the situation that you find yourself in, whether it's your job, your education, your family situation, or your health, doesn't define you or how you view yourself. I have no doubt that my grandmother, who worked for Mrs. Roskin for more than 30 years, did become her trusted advisor and her true and constant friend. My grandmother worked incredibly hard, did her job exceedingly well, and she thrived in this country. Julia O'Toole took great pride in the fact that she was a trusted and dependable worker 
who helped support her family of four children through very hard times in this country. And yes, she loved glamour and elegance, and yes, she was a maid. She saw no disconnect in that. And thanks to her, neither do I. The value of doing a job and doing it well is enough in itself. In one of his Pallister novels, Anthony Trollope wrote that while it is important for a young person entering life to decide whether he or she will make hats or shoes, that is not nearly as important as the decision whether to make excellent or mediocre hats or shoes. My grandmother cleaned, tidied, organized, and beautified. She did her job exceedingly well, but more importantly, she did it with uncommon spirit and style. She had the ability to take whatever she had, no matter how small, and truly make it shine. There was something incredibly compelling and undeniably American about her optimism. She never felt sorry for herself. She would put on her lipstick, usually a Max Factor Coral, it's a nice <laughs> pot of tea, and have a good laugh. This outlook was forged over decades of living a life that was never easy. As I grew older, my own mother told me more stories about how she and her siblings had to work from a very young age to help keep their struggling immigrant family afloat. My grandfather, Harry Wessel, is a first generation American. He helped build the Holland Tunnel and worked construction. His father, Thor Wessel, had come through Ellis Island from Sweden in 1893, and my grandpa grew up in the gritty Hell's Kitchen section of New York and had to quit school in the eighth grade to help his struggling immigrant family. So they had tough times, and my own mom and all her siblings worked various jobs from very early ages. I remember once when I was looking through my mom's yearbook from the 50s, and she was a pretty and popular majorette in high school, and she was telling me how she would clean the lunchroom in order to get the hot lunch. And being a child of my own times and generation, my immediate response was, Mom, weren't you ever embarrassed to be wiping down the tables and cleaning the lunch trays in front of your friends? And I was really surprised at her response, and it taught me a lot. She said, no, I was so proud of myself for getting that job, which lots of kids wanted back then. I got to eat the hot lunch, which is, was a big deal in the 1950s. And having to work for the money myself was never a source of shame or embarrassment to me. By our standards and today's standards, they may have been poor, but my mom doesn't ever remember feeling that way. And she believes that my grandparents' outlook their sense of humor, their fierce pride, their work ethic, had everything to do with that in spite of the hard times. She remembers a difficult year that my grandfather lost all of their savings in a failed construction venture. They lived in upstate New York, and my mom and her older sister and brother had all outgrown their coats and boots and had nothing to get them through that freezing upstate winter when they had to walk to school and walk to their job. So my grandmother went down to the Salvation Army that year, seeking coats and boots for her kids. According to my mom, accepting that charity really hurt my grandmother's pride, but there was no other choice. They survived that winter, but Julia O'Toole never forgot how humbling it was to be the recipient of those donated coats. And my mom says she'll never forget the next Thanksgiving Grandma waking her up very early the day after Thanksgiving to take her and her sisters down to the Salvation Army where they folded clothes and filled food baskets and rang the bell to, get to help out. And they volunteered every year after that. And my mom says, typical teenager, I only complained one time over Christmas about getting up early over my break to volunteer at Salvation Army. And she's like, you know, Grandma set me straight. She looked me hard in the eye and she said, Lillian, we have a debt to the Salvation Army. They gave us Christian charity when we needed them, and we will repay our debt by helping them help other people. We will hold our heads high. That was the pride of my grandmother and the work ethic of her entire generation. You could not hold your head high without hard work. They may have received coats from the Salvation Army one year, but Julia O'Toole made sure that they helped give them out the very next. In spite of those hardships, my grandmother had a great hopefulness about her that never wavered. 
and she and my grandfather did achieve their own piece of the American dream. All four of their children were very successful in this country and helped them in their own ways after my grandparents retired. They settled into a small rented house in Kentucky and after so many years in New York, they always said they wished they'd gotten there sooner. And they started spending their winters at my parents' beachfront condo in Florida, where they played golf and made friends with all the other retired snowbirds down in Florida. With her musical Irish brogue, stylish scarves, and love of a highball by the pool. I know those <laughs> other retired ladies probably had no idea just how hard my grandmother's life had been. Not that she would want them to. She would much rather brag about her successful children and grandchildren, her American dream. She always made me feel that I had made her proud, and she absolutely adored Rand. He used to joke that she was great for his ophthalmology practice, because whenever she had an appointment to see him, she would sit in the waiting room and brag loudly <laughs> to anyone with an earshot about what a brilliant surgeon he was. He knows everything about the eye, don't you know? She would say. <laughs> she was that way with all of her children and grandchildren, though. Lavish with praise, delighted with even the smallest achievement, and a true believer in all of our best qualities. While it was occasionally embarrassing, she made you feel special, worthy, and loved. Fifteen years after she passed away, I carried that cast off her into the White House Christmas party. And as I stepped into the foyer, my eyes were wide with the beauty and the grandeur of it all. The dozens of sparkling Christmas trees and the Marine band in their brilliant red and gold brocade uniforms playing, and all the glittering people standing in those historic marble halls. I had to take a deep breath, and when I looked out at my arm, that little beaded purse just shined in the light, and I knew that my grandmother was smiling. After all, she had an abiding faith in the possibilities of this country. Her optimism and her belief that with faith, hard work, and a great attitude, anything can happen, those are quintessential American beliefs, and they are the legacy of Julia O'Toole, my Irish blessing. Mm -hmm. <laughs>